Welcome to worship with Clinton Presbyterian Church. Thank you everyone for joining us either in person or online this morning. We are glad you have joined us for worship. Today, we are happy to welcome our friends from Camp Wilmont. Welcome. Okay. As we listen to the prelude, please take a deep breath, settle into your space, and look around at the beautiful faces of those who are gathered this morning. Let us pray. As sunflowers seek the sun, we come here seeking your face, O oh God. Hear our prayers. Revive us from the slumber of violence, greed, and willful ignorance. Raise us up like a host of sunflowers, ready to spread seeds of new life. Amen. Please join me in taking a moment to greet one another with peace. Don't forget to come up to the camera and greet the folks on Zoom. The peace of Christ be with, be with you all. The intro has three parts. One part is for me, one will be for anyone who is in the sanctuary in this person, in person this morning in italics, 
and one will be for those joining us remotely in bold. Those joining us via Zoom, please unmute your mics so we can hear you. God, we have come to put your words into our hearts and souls. We have come to teach your words to our children. We remember your promises. We are here to remember your love. And to remember it when we are far away. God, put your words and your love into our hearts. Amen. Hear now the call to reconciliation. Jesus calls us, as members of this church, to be accountable to God and to one another, confessing our sin, repairing the damage done, and working together for reconciliation. And Jesus promises that he will be with us in this work. Whenever two or three gather in his name, let us pray. God of our ancestors, you have remained faithful to us from generation to generation, but we have broken our promises. We test your patience and question your good news. Forgive us, we pray. Recreate us as your people and restore us to your image. Continue to bless us and let us be a blessing for others. Hear now the act of praise. We are forgiven, we are forgiven, we are forgiven. For all the things we have done and the things we failed to do, we are forgiven, we are forgiven, we are forgiven. For our sins against God and our sins against one another, we are forgiven, we are forgiven, we are forgiven. Not just seven, seven times or 77 times or even seven, 70 times seven, but over and over and always. Thanks be to God. Good morning, my name is Rick Adi, and I'm glad to be with you. I, I think the last time I was with you was a few Octobers ago online. Um, and at, on that day, I, I had to preach and run uh, because I had to get to Albany by the afternoon for a, a cousin's memorial service. So uh, good to be here in, in person. Uh, and I was thinking, Clinton is actually, it, it's between Nashua, New Hampshire and Clinton as to which is the closest church to where we live. 
And I, I think most of my ministry years were in the Pittsburgh area. And in, in Pittsburgh, in the county where we lived, uh, there were 40 Presbyterian churches just in that county. And in one town, uh, with, there were three Presbyterian churches within about two blocks of each other. So moving to New, New York and then New England, um, it's kind of been an eye opener to find Presbyterians. So. Um, Lisa and I are going to read the uh, scripture as a as a dialogue, um, um, and uh, since Lisa is God, um, she 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 is up here, and I, I will be Abraham and down here. But I'd like to first share um, something that I read in Presbyterian Outlook um, by a pastor from Taos, New Mexico, uh, named Ginny Barabi, and she had kind of the same reaction I did to this the scripture in Genesis uh, that we're going to hear. She writes, so many things go terribly, horribly wrong in this week's reading from Genesis 22, including most notably, God's call for Abraham to sacrifice his son. What? She writes, what's worse, this hero of our faith is willing to go through with it. Where's this guy's book of order mandated child protection policy? <laughs> I'm not going to excuse God or Abraham in this text. The way they toy with Isaac's life is utterly inexcusable. But I do think we make a mistake, she writes, if we read this story as a one-way test of faith. There are two sides to every covenant. In verse 1, the narrator tells us that God is testing Abraham. But as the story develops, perhaps we will see that Abraham and the whole of the covenant people are also in a way testing God. The first scripture lesson is the Genesis 22 account of God's command to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. We'll hear it as a dialogue between God and Abraham. Again, I will read the words of Abraham and Lisa will be God and read the narrative section. After these things, I tested Abraham. Abraham. Here I am. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that I had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and Abraham replied, Here I am, my son. Isaac said to his father, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? God will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that I had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But my angel called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then I looked up, and I saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. I went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of my son. I called that place, the Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Matthew devotes the entire 10th chapter of his gospel to Jesus' preparation of his disciples to go out on their mission. He tells them what they are to take, how they are to act, who they might confront, and what they are to teach. Our three verse lesson is the conclusion of these instructions and we will hear the word welcome numerous times. Let us hear God's word to us in Matthew 10 beginning at verse 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet and will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I tend to be one who kind of keeps things, um, I keep my window open on my laptop and I keep uh, windows open, little different windows open so I don't forget where they are. And so earlier this spring, I kept a whip window open on my computer on which appeared the application to be one of those chosen to attend the Antiques Roadshow. For those who don't know, this popular television program travels to different cities and in preparation, people clean out their attics and their basements seeking to find something that the show's antique dealers will appraise to be worth a fortune. The show came to Sturbridge Village a month ago. That's what my application was for. And I was not there not because I wasn't chosen, but because I never submitted the application. <laughs> if you've seen the show, you are familiar with the scenario of someone bringing in a family heirloom and vehemently vowing they have no intention to ever sell it. Then after a lengthy explanation of the history of the piece and the pros and cons of its condition, the de dealer reveals that dear old grandma's cherished never to leave the family heirloom is worth over $100,000. At that moment, there appears a surprise. Well, I never sparkle in the owner's eyes. And again, it's the cynic in me that wonders how cherished that heirloom remains once the camera pans away. I mean, how loyal to grandma must one be? <clears throat> In modern parlance, we use the phrase, everything has its price. Everyone can be bought. To find that price, we usually ask a form of the question, what would it take? What would it take for you to part with grandma's heirloom? What would it take to seal the deal to win a contract? What would it take for you to compromise your honesty for a promotion or your integrity for a reward? Everything has its price. Everyone can be bought. What will it take? In a little less sinister way, we ask what would it take when we are negotiating for a job or even within a relationship? What would it take to prove my faithfulness to you? What would it take to show that I can do this job? What would it take for you to believe that I am trustworthy? I thought of this because I began to read into this morning's Genesis text a what would it take mindset. So I hear, almost hear God pondering, what would it take for Abraham to prove he truly fears me and I have his undivided loyalty? And that weird command is what it would take is for Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, 
his beloved son. I share Jenny Barbie's reaction to that this testing by God with the child sacrifice does not leave me in a happily ever after mood, even with that last minute ram rescue. What kind of God is it that makes such a cruel command, such an unthinkable request? It's unfair, it's ungodly. And we might say, certainly this cannot be our God. Our God is a loving God. Much the way a parent of a child accused of wrongdoing says, certainly it cannot be my kid, my kid's a good kid. This story takes us into the land of how can this be? How could this be God? And invites us to struggle with our understandings of God. It serves as a reminder that any time we try to isolate God by saying either this is who God is or this cannot be of God, we succumb to the temptation to set boundaries for God and God's realm. Let's look just at that unsettling fact that God doesn't know the extent of God's loyalty of Abraham's loyalty, I'm sorry. He doesn't know how loyal Abraham is. God didn't know. For me, that's an odd thing to voice in Scripture. And listen to what the angel says in what I picture to be a scene where Abraham is stopped just as his knife is on its downward thrust, and on television we'd break for a commercial at that point to get you to come back. And then we return and hear the angel say, for now I know. For now I know, Abraham, that you fear God, for you have not withheld your son, your only son, your beloved son from me. For now I know. It's an important phrase, for it certainly implies that prior to this, God did not know. If God had known how Abraham would react, then the so-called test would be a sham, a mean-spirited game played by an all-knowing God. Fact is, we need to read the scripture as if God did not know, and thus the need for the test. Yet the other reality is that God is never going to allow Isaac to be sacrificed. Think about it. If Abram had failed the test and refused to sacrifice his son, Isaac would be alive. If Abraham, as he did, passed the test, God was going to rescue the boy anyway. I don't think Isaac would think back on that as being a good thing for what he went through. But Abraham knows beyond understanding that God will find a way to bring life even in this scenario of death. Just Abraham doesn't know how. I'm not comfortable with this kind of biblical account. We do have a God who desires our loyalty and a God who truly may not know our own loyalty. I don't like the idea of God who puts us to the test, of, certainly of this kind. But I find assurance in the idea of a God who promises to provide for us, even if we don't know how that provision will be made or when, and when is sometimes the hardest thing to wait for. Abraham wished for a rescue, but there was no animal substitute in sight as he placed Isaac on the altar. From a human point of view, if it's not in sight, it does not exist, out of sight, out of mind, out of hope. Yet for God, the ram was always in sight. So we trust that the God who commands or tests loyalty will also provide for the loyal. Undoubtedly easier to say to live than to live. Perhaps with me, you are tempted to create a God of your own liking 
of our own making. A God who we can predict. A God who would never make an unthinkable request of us. A God with whom we can be comfortable. A God who makes us comfortable. Of course, with any self-created God, we are quickly left to despair, if not downright anger, when God does not fulfill our predictions or meet our expectations and desires. As I thought about the Abraham story, in terms of God's unthinkable request of Abraham, I considered the connection with our three verse gospel lesson about the disciples being welcomed when they went out. What Jesus is teaching his disciples is a historic Jewish concept by which the authorized messenger is to be treated the same way as the one who sent the messenger. In this case, Jesus is sending the disciples and they are to be received the way Jesus would be received. And then Jesus adds the way God would be received. And those who do so will be rewarded. It would seem we could find ourselves in a position to be tested on either side of Jesus' welcoming command, both in our willingness to go out and be Jesus' disciples sent into the world, and as those who are called to welcome others who come to us. Sometimes the unthinkable request is not the offering of a cup of water, but accepting the cup of water from another. I remember being on a mission trip to Mexico when, were, when a family for whom we were building a house, and this house was on an old garbage dump, on their own sacrificed several of their precious chickens and invited us to eat with them. As might have been yours, our immediate reaction was not to accept their hospitality to essentially make the families offer to us an unthinkable request of us because of their poverty. Yet in doing so, we would have been rejecting a gift of welcome offered with love and with grace. Thus we're reminded that it is sometimes we who are the stranger at the door in need of hospitality and of welcome. Could both kinds of requests be for us an Abrahamic test of loyalty? Who will you allow to welcome you? And who will you welcome in my name? At those times when we say we don't have time to welcome, I think Jesus would say, well, program it into your Google calendar. And if we refuse the hospitality of others out of pride or fear of owing them something, I think Jesus would say, swallow your pride hard. And if we begin to ration our welcome by drawing lines of division within God's creation, I think Jesus would say, you need to expand your understanding of God's providence and grace. The good news is that faithful obedience to the request is linked to the assurance that God will provide for us for all. The Genesis text, while disturbing, is a story of testing loyalty in, in the end of God's promised provision. It seems Jesus is checking our loyalty also to his kingdom vision by asking, what would it take for you to be a welcoming people, an inclusive community? Perhaps part of the answer to that question is found in the Antiques Roadshow question I ask, what would it take for you to part with your grandma's heirloom? For sometimes we need to let go of heirlooms, not to make a fortune, but because they are weighing us down. 
And with all due respect to grandma, we might need to ask, what would it take for you to part with your grandma's heirloom prejudices, worn out traditions, and even misunderstandings of scripture, all of which can be barriers to being a welcoming community. Welcoming and hospitality, Jesus visualizes as a cup of water being offered. Perhaps the cup of water offered by a relief worker overseas is from the USA or from China or Saudi Arabia. It could be from the Red Cross or the Red Crescent or Church World Service. Perhaps the water is offered by a Muslim to a Jew, an atheist to a Christian, a tribal leader to a Hindu, a conservative Christian to a secular humanist, a liberal Christian to a member of the radical right. We see the picture. And what is important is that welcome is expressed in the sharing of the water, not the differences between recipient and giver. And as multiple cups of water are offered, I envision God joyously providing a bubbling up fountain of welcoming care. And as we welcome and receive disciples and prophets and little ones in Jesus' name, we are showing the loyalty to the one who has sent us, who is the same one who welcomes us at this communion table this morning. And the family of faith is not only enlarged, but it is strengthened in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. This is not a Presbyterian table. It is not a Clinton Presbyterian table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ who extends a broad welcome to all those who will come to put their faith in him and seek to remember him in the breaking of bread and seek the fellowship of the whole body. As I prepared the, the sermon, I, what came to mind as part of the invitation is maybe a familiar hymn. I'm going to eat at the welcome table, an African-American spiritual. The five verses, I'm going to eat at the welcome table. I'm going to eat and drink with my Jesus. I'm going to join with sisters, brothers. Here all the world will find a welcome. We're going to feast on milk and honey. I'm going to eat at the welcome table. Let us pray. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal and triune God, whom we worship as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ, you spoke the word that brought the world into being. By the Holy Spirit, you brought order out of chaos and breathe life into your creatures in parental love. <clears throat> you stood by us in spite of our disobedience, correcting us with gracious reproof and welcoming us again into your loving embrace. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. Born of Mary, he came to dwell among us full of grace and truth. 
To all who believed, he gave the power to become your children. In ministry among your own, Jesus cared for all, forgiving their failures, healing their hurts, and nurturing their faith, giving himself in utter sacrifice for those he loved. He inspired ordinary folk to spirit-filled living and displayed in his life, death, and rising again, the power of your spirit. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service and the service of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As has been the custom within this congregation, I think you probably all know that when the bread is served, we hold it and then receive it together in the same with the cup, we receive it together. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. body of Christ, our bread of life. In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. As he poured it out, he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Friends, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Blood of Christ, our cup of salvation. Let us pray. 
Oh God, we thank you for the supper shared in the spirit with your son, Jesus. May we be strengthened by the fellowship of sharing communion together so that we can go out ready to be welcomed and to welcome others. In Christ's name, amen. We pray for those who are lost and seek direction. We pray for the governments of every land. We pray for churches throughout the world. We pray for those who have suffered from natural disasters. We pray for those who live in our community. We pray, O oh God, that you will hear and answer our prayers in due time. Until then, Keep us steadfast in our faith. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you to everyone who has shown love for our community by giving to support the church this week. God's call to us is woven into the very fabric of creation. For God has given us, given to us every good thing, entrusting us to be stewards of all we have received. If you are able, please take a moment to visit our online giving site or mail your offering to the church. Those in person, you are invited to bring your offering up and place it in the basket after we have started singing. You gotta stand out. <laughs> walk, 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 walking in the light. Oh, walk, 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 walking in the light. Oh, walk, 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 walking in the light. Walking in the light of God. Oh, walk, 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 walking in the light. Oh, walk. Walk, 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 walking in the light. Oh, walk, 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 walking in the light, walking in the light of God. Oh, oh, walk, 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 walking in the light. Oh, walk, 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 walking in the light. Oh, walk, 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 walking in the light. Walking in the light of God. Let us pray. Merciful God, we give you thanks that you have given us many different gifts for service in the one body of Christ. Use us, our gifts and offerings, to do your will in the world, contributing to those in need, making peace with our neighbors, and overcoming evil with good. Amen. All right, now we got some announcements. So volunteers are needed for basically everything. And then Pat's memorial service will be held July 8th at 11 a.m. The family will be providing a little bit of food. Uh, please let Jen or Melanie know if you plan on attending so we can give the family a count of people. On July 23rd, we, ha we are having Christmas in July. Session has approved a summertime collection to support the kiddos in Jen Dickinson's seventh grade classroom. Jen has been providing snacks and period products for the kids. We will collect them on July 23rd. Does anyone else have any announcements? Please join me as you have in other parts of the service in one of the three parts of this prayer. One part is for me, the worship leader. One will be for anyone who is in the sanctuary in person this morning in italics. 
and one will be for those joining us remotely in bold. Those joining us on Zoom, please unmute your mic so we can hear you. We have been set free. We have been given new life. So we can bring new life to others. We have been blessed abundantly. Listen for the voice of God calling you. It is there. It is there. God will go God will with go us with each us step, step of the way. Of the way. not so much an unthinkable request that Jesus makes, but a commandment to be faithful to him, to show loyalty by being a welcoming body, by showing commitment, by receiving the welcome that Jesus has for you, and that others may offer you without you even knowing it. Let us go in peace. The blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer now abide in our hearts and minds this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Yeah.